A railway electrification system supplies electric power to railway trains and trams without an onboard prime mover or local fuel supply. Electric railways use electric locomotives to haul passengers or freight in separate cars or electric multiple units, passenger cars with their own motors. Electricity is typically generated in large and relatively efficient generating stations, transmitted to the railway network and distributed to the trains. Some electric railways have their own dedicated generating stations and transmission lines but most purchase power from an electric utility. The railway usually provides its own distribution lines, switches and transformers. Power is supplied to moving trains with a nearly continuous conductor running along the track that usually takes one of two forms, overhead line, suspended from poles or towers along the track or from structure or tunnel ceilings, third rail mounted at track level and contacted by a sliding pickup shoe. Both overhead wire and third rail systems usually use the running rails as the return conductor but some systems use a separate fourth rail for this purpose. In comparison to the principal alternative, the diesel engine, electric railways offer substantially better energy efficiency, lower emissions and lower operating costs. Electric locomotives are also usually quieter, more powerful, and more responsive and reliable than diesels. They have no local emissions, an important advantage in tunnels and urban areas. Some electric traction systems provide regenerative braking that turns the train's kinetic energy back into electricity and returns it to the supply system to be used by other trains or the general utility grid. While diesel locomotives burn petroleum, electricity can be generated from diverse sources including renewable energy. Disadvantages of electric traction include high capital costs that may be uneconomic on lightly trafficked routes, a relative lack of flexibility, since electric trains need electrified tracks or overhead wires and a vulnerability to power interruptions. Different regions may use different supply voltages and frequencies, complicating through service and requiring greater complexity of locomotive power. The limited clearances available under overhead lines may preclude efficient double stack container service. Railway electrification has constantly increased in the past decades, and as of 2012, electrified tracks account for nearly one third of total tracks globally. Topic <laughs> classification. Electrification systems are classified by three main parameters Voltage Current Direct current DC, Alternating current AC, Frequency Contact system Third rail Fourth rail Overhead lines catenary, Overhead lines plus linear motor Four rail system Five rail system Selection of an electrification system is based on economics of energy supply, maintenance, and capital cost compared to the revenue obtained for freight and passenger traffic. Different systems are used for urban and intercity areas. Some electric locomotives can switch to different supply voltages to allow flexibility in operation. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Standardized voltages. 6 of the most commonly used voltages have been selected for European and international standardization. Some of these are independent of the contact system used, so that for example, 750 volts DC may be used with either third rail or overhead lines. 
There are many other voltage systems used for railway electrification systems around the world, and the list of railway electrification systems covers both standard voltage and non-standard voltage systems. The permissible range of voltages allowed for the standardized voltages is as stated in standards BSN 50163 and IEC 60850. These take into account the number of trains drawing current and their distance from the substation. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Direct current. Increasing availability of high voltage semiconductors may allow the use of higher and more efficient DC voltages that heretofore have only been practical with AC. Topic overhead systems 1500 volts DC is used in Japan, Indonesia, Hong Kong parts, Republic of Ireland, Australia parts, France also using 25 kV 50 Hz AC, New Zealand Wellington, Singapore on the Northeast MRT line, the United States Chicago area on the Metro Electric District and the South Shore Line Interurban Line and in Seattle Seattle Washington, Sound Transit light rail lines. In Slovakia, there are two narrow gauge lines in the High Tatras, one a cog railway. In the Netherlands, it is used on the main system, alongside 25 kV on the HSL Zuid and Batuwalan, and 3000 V south of Maastricht. In Portugal, it is used in the Casque line and in Denmark on the suburban S train system 1650 volts DC. In the United Kingdom, 1500 volts DC was used in 1954 for the Woodhead Trans Pennine route, now closed. The system used regenerative braking, allowing for transfer of energy between climbing and descending trains on the steep approaches to the tunnel. The system was also used for suburban electrification in East London and Manchester, now converted to 25 kV AC. It is now only used for the Tyne and Weir Metro. In India, 1500 V DC was the first electrification system launched in 1925 in Mumbai area. Between 2012 to 2016, the electrification was converted to 25 kV 50 Hz AC which is the countrywide system. 3 kV DC is used in Belgium, Italy, Spain, Poland, the Northern Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia, South Africa, Chile, former Soviet Union countries also using 25 kV 50 Hz AC and the Netherlands from south of the city of Maastricht to the Belgium border, which is currently exclusively used by the Belgium NMBS Rail Company. It was formerly used by the Milwaukee Road from Harlow Town, Montana to Seattle Tacoma, across the Continental Divide and including extensive branch and loop lines in Montana, and by the Delaware, Lackawanna and Western Railroad now New Jersey Transit, converted to 25 kV AC in the United States, and the Kolkata Suburban Railway Main Line in India, before it was converted to 25 5 kV 50 Hz AC. DC voltages between 600 V and 800 V are used by most tramways streetcars, trolleybus networks and underground subway systems. <laughs> Overhead systems with linear motor See overhead systems with linear motor. Topic: <inaudible> Third rail. Most electrification systems use overhead wires, but third rail is an option up to 1,500 volts, as is the case with Shenzhen Metro Line 3. Third rail systems exclusively use DC distribution. 
The use of AC is not feasible because the dimensions of a third rail are physically very large compared with the skin depth that the alternating current penetrates to 0.3 mm or 0.012 inches in a steel rail. This effect makes the resistance per unit length unacceptably high compared with the use of DC. Third rail is more compact than overhead wires and can be used in smaller diameter tunnels, an important factor for subway systems. <laughs> Rubber tired systems A few lines of the Paris Metro in France operate on a four-rail power scheme. The trains move on rubber tires which roll on a pair of narrow rollways made of steel and, in some places, of concrete. Since the tires do not conduct the return current, the two guide bars provided outside the running rollways become, in a sense, a third and fourth rail which each provide 750 volts DC, so at least electrically it is a four-rail scheme. Each wheel set of a powered truck carries one traction motor. A side sliding side running contact shoe picks up the current from the vertical face of each guide bar. The return of each traction motor, as well as each wagon, is effected by one contact shoe each that slide on top of each one of the running rails. This and all other rubber tired metros that have a 1,435 mm in standard gauge track between the rollways operate in the same manner. <laughs> Alternating current Railways and electrical utilities use AC for the same reason, to use transformers, which require AC, to produce higher voltages. The higher the voltage, the lower the current for the same power, which reduces line loss, thus allowing higher power to be delivered. Because alternating current is used with high voltages, this method of electrification is only used on overhead wires, never on third rails. Inside the locomotive, a transformer steps the voltage down for use by the traction motors and auxiliary loads. An early advantage of AC is that the power wasting resistors used in DC locomotives for speed control were not needed in an AC locomotive. Multiple taps on the transformer can supply a range of voltages. Separate low voltage transformer windings supply lighting and the motors driving auxiliary machinery. More recently, the development of very high power semiconductors has caused the classic universal AC-DC motor to be largely replaced with the three-phase induction motor fed by a variable frequency drive, a special inverter that varies both frequency and voltage to control motor speed. These drives can run equally well on DC or AC of any frequency, and many modern electric locomotives are designed to handle different supply voltages and frequencies to simplify cross-border operation. <laughs> Low frequency alternating current Five European countries, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Norway and Sweden, have standardized on 15 kV 16 and 2 thirds Hz the 50 Hz mains frequency divided by 3 single phase AC. On 16 October 1995 Germany, Austria and Switzerland changed from 16 and 2 thirds Hz to 16.7 Hz which is no longer exactly one third of the grid frequency. This solved overheating problems with the rotary converters used to generate some of this power from the grid supply. In the UK, the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway pioneered overhead electrification of its suburban lines in London, London Bridge to Victoria being opened to traffic on the 1st of December 1909. 
Victoria to Crystal Palace via Balham and West Norwood opened in May 1911. Peckham Rye to West Norwood opened in June 1912. Further extensions were not made owing to the First World War. Two lines opened in 1925 under the Southern Railway serving Coolsdon North and Sutton Railway Station. The lines were electrified at 6.7 kV 25 Hz. It was announced in 1926 that all lines were to be converted to DC Third Rail and the last overhead electric service ran in September 1929. <laughs> Non-contact systems It is possible to supply power to an electric train by inductive coupling. This allows the use of a high-voltage, insulated, conductor rail. Such a system was patented in 1894 by Nikola Tesla, U.S. Patent 514972. It requires the use of high-frequency alternating current. Tesla did not specify a frequency but George Trinkhouse suggests that around 1000 Hz would be likely. Inductive coupling is widely used in low-power applications, such as rechargeable electric toothbrushes and more recently, mobile telephones and wearable computing devices inductive charging. The contactless technology for rail vehicles is currently being marketed by Bombardier as PRIMOVE. Energy efficiency Electric versus diesel Electric trains need not carry the weight of prime movers, transmission and fuel. This is partly offset by the weight of electrical equipment. Regenerative braking returns power to the electrification system so that it may be used elsewhere, by other trains on the same system or returned to the general power grid. This is especially useful in mountainous areas where heavily loaded trains must descend long grades. Central station electricity can often be generated with higher efficiency than a mobile engine – generator. While the efficiency of power plant generation and diesel locomotive generation are roughly the same in the nominal regime, diesel motors decrease in efficiency in non-nominal regimes at low power while if an electric power plant needs to generate less power it will shut down its least efficient generators, thereby increasing efficiency. The electric train can save energy as compared to diesel by regenerative braking and by not needing to consume energy by idling as diesel locomotives do when stopped or coasting. However, electric rolling stock may run cooling blowers when stopped or coasting, thus consuming energy. Large fossil fuel power stations operate at high efficiency, and can be used for district heating or to produce district cooling, leading to a higher total efficiency. <laughs> AC versus DC for main lines Modern electrification systems take AC energy from a power grid which is delivered to a locomotive and converted to a DC voltage to be used by traction motors. These motors may either be DC motors which directly use the DC or they may be three-phase AC motors which require further conversion of the DC to three-phase AC using power electronics. Thus both systems are faced with the same task, converting and transporting high-voltage AC from the power grid to low-voltage DC in the locomotive. The difference between AC and DC electrification systems lies in where the AC is converted to DC, at the substation or on the train. 
Energy efficiency and infrastructure costs determine which of these is used on a network, although this is often fixed due to pre-existing electrification systems. Both the transmission and conversion of electric energy involve losses, ohmic losses in wires and power electronics, magnetic field losses in transformers and smoothing reactors inductors. Power conversion for a DC system takes place mainly in a railway substation where large, heavy, and more efficient hardware can be used as compared to an AC system where conversion takes place aboard the locomotive where space is limited and losses are significantly higher. Also, the energy used to blow air to cool transformers, power electronics including rectifiers, and other conversion hardware must be accounted for. <laughs> Comparison with diesel traction Electric locomotives may easily be constructed with greater power output than most diesel locomotives. For passenger operation it is possible to provide enough power with diesel engines but, at higher speeds, this proves costly and impractical. Therefore, almost all high-speed trains are electric. The high power of electric locomotives also gives them the ability to pull freight at higher speed over gradients. In mixed traffic conditions, this increases capacity when the time between trains can be decreased. The higher power of electric locomotives and an electrification can also be a cheaper alternative to a new and less steep railway if trains' weights are to be increased on a system. On the other hand, electrification may not be suitable for lines with low frequency of traffic, because lower running cost of trains may be outweighed by the high cost of the electrification infrastructure. Therefore, most long-distance lines in developing or sparsely populated countries are not electrified due to relatively low frequency of trains. Maintenance costs of the lines may be increased by electrification, but many systems claim lower costs due to reduced wear and tear from lighter rolling stock. There are some additional maintenance costs associated with the electrical equipment around the track, such as power substations and the catenary wire itself, but, if there is sufficient traffic, the reduced track and especially the lower engine maintenance and running costs exceed the costs of this maintenance significantly. Network effects are a large factor with electrification. When converting lines to electric, the connections with other lines must be considered. Some electrifications have subsequently been removed because of the through traffic to non-electrified lines. If through traffic is to have any benefit, time-consuming engine switches must occur to make such connections or expensive dual-mode engines must be used. This is mostly an issue for long-distance trips, but many lines come to be dominated by through traffic from long-haul freight trains usually running coal, ore, or containers to or from ports. In theory, these trains could enjoy dramatic savings through electrification, but it can be too costly to extend electrification to isolated areas, and unless an entire network is electrified, companies often find that they need to continue use of diesel trains even if sections are electrified. The increasing demand for container traffic which is more efficient when utilizing the double-stack car also has network effect issues with existing electrifications due to insufficient clearance of overhead electrical lines for these trains, but electrification can be built or modified to have sufficient clearance, at additional cost. A problem specifically related to electrified lines are gaps in the electrification. Electric vehicles, especially locomotives, lose power when traversing gaps in the supply, such as phase change gaps in overhead systems, and gaps over points in third rail systems. 
These become a nuisance, if the locomotive stops with its collector on a dead gap, in which case there is no power to restart. Power gaps can be overcome by onboard batteries or motor flywheel generator systems. In 2014, progress is being made in the use of large capacitors to power electric vehicles between stations, and so avoid the need for overhead wires between those stations. Advantages No exposure to passengers to exhaust from the locomotive Lower cost of building, running and maintaining locomotives and multiple units Higher power to weight ratio no onboard fuel tanks, resulting in Fewer locomotives Faster acceleration Higher practical limit of power Higher limit of speed Less noise pollution, quieter operation Faster acceleration clears lines more quickly to run more trains on the track in urban rail uses Reduced power loss at higher altitudes for power loss see diesel engine Independence of running costs from fluctuating fuel prices Service to underground stations where diesel trains cannot operate for safety reasons Reduced environmental pollution, especially in highly populated urban areas, even if electricity is produced by fossil fuels Easily accommodates kinetic energy brake reclaim using supercapacitors More comfortable ride on multiple units as trains have no underfloor diesel engines Somewhat higher energy efficiency in part due to regenerative braking and less power lost when idling. More flexible primary energy source, can use coal, nuclear, hydro or wind as the primary energy source instead of oil. <laughs> Disadvantages Electrification cost – Electrification requires an entire new infrastructure to be built around the existing tracks at a significant cost. Costs are especially high when tunnels, bridges and other obstructions have to be altered for clearance. Another aspect that can raise the cost of electrification are the alterations or upgrades to railway signaling needed for new traffic characteristics, and to protect signaling circuitry and track circuits from interference by traction current. Electrification may require line closures while the new equipment is being installed. Appearance, the overhead line structures and cabling can have a significant landscape impact compared with a non-electrified or third rail electrified line that has only occasional signaling equipment above ground level. Fragility and vulnerability, overhead electrification systems can suffer severe disruption due to minor mechanical faults or the effects of high winds causing the pantograph of a moving train to become entangled with the catenary, ripping the wires from their supports. The damage is often not limited to the supply to one track, but extends to those for adjacent tracks as well, causing the entire route to be blocked for a considerable time. Third rail systems can suffer disruption in cold weather due to ice forming on the conductor rail. Theft, the high scrap value of copper and the unguarded, remote installations make overhead cables an attractive target for scrap metal thieves. Attempts at theft of live 25 kV cables may end in the thief's death from electrocution. In the UK, cable theft is claimed to be one of the biggest sources of delay and disruption to train services—though this normally relates to signalling cable, which is equally problematic for diesel lines. People may climb onto standing train cars, and some are seriously hurt or killed when they come too close to the overhead contact line. 
Birds may perch on parts with different charges, and animals may also touch the electrification system. Animals fallen to the ground are fetched by foxes or other predators. In most of the world's railway networks, the height clearance of overhead electrical lines is not sufficient for a double stack container car. <laughs> World electrification In 2006, 240,000 kilometers, 150,000 miles, 25% by length of the world rail network was electrified and 50% of all rail transport was carried by electric traction. In 2012 for electrified kilometers, China surpassed Russia making it first place in the world with over 48,000 kilometers, 30,000 miles electrified. Trailing behind China were Russia 43,300 kilometers, 26,900 miles, India 30,012 kilometers, 18,649 miles, Germany 21,000 kilometers, 13,000 miles, Japan 17,000 kilometers, 11,000 miles, and France 15,200 kilometers, 9,400 miles. Topic: Sparks effect. Newly electrified lines often show a sparks effect, whereby electrification in passenger rail systems leads to significant jumps in patronage revenue. The reasons may include electric trains being seen as more modern and attractive to ride, faster and smoother service, and the fact that electrification often goes hand in hand with a general infrastructure and rolling stock overhaul replacement, which leads to better service quality in a way that theoretically could also be achieved by doing similar upgrades yet without electrification. Whatever the causes of the sparks effect, it is well established for numerous routes that have electrified over decades. See also <laughs> <laughs>